Hello everybody, my name is Ian Lamont and this is the Amazon Deep Dive video on ancillary products and this is for publishers. It's part of a video series that I've created on various Amazon programs that publishers can use to improve or grow their business but a little disclaimer just as it's possible to make a lot of money using some of these programs it's also possible to lose a lot of money. It's up to you to follow Amazon's terms and make decisions that are best for your business. So the way that I always start this particular presentation when I'm talking with publishers is to present this particular shot of um, Amazon search results. And it's showing a bunch of products that don't look like they have anything to do with each other, a teddy bear, a t-shirt, and a wine goblet. But actually they do because they're all using a phrase, a very famous phrase from the HBO hit TV series Game of Thrones which is also based on a book series called The Song of Fire and Ice. And what's interesting to me is that if you look on Amazon, you'll run into products like this that are originally came from some sort of uh, book or publishing venture. Um, sometimes these uh, terms or characters, they may be licensed from the producer, either of the movie or of the book series. But in other cases, uh, they're just, they don't have a trademark on them. And some enterprising people have decided just to make a t-shirt or something with the Mother of Dragons on it and then give it, give it a, a font that looks like Game of Thrones. And it's not just those types of uh, toys or uh, you know, shirts or, you know, t or coffee mugs or things like that. You can also find educational kits. Uh, this is based on the Magic School Bus book series, which is also a TV series. It's called The World of Germs. And then, of course, uh, the Harry Potter generated a lot of different ideas for products from pajamas to uh, to wands and these look like these look like they're licensed goods uh, but you know why should a publisher even consider doing something like this well the opportunity is if you're selling books it's actually a pretty slow growth arena uh, you know that in many in some years the actual size of the marketplace goes down although occasionally there'll be a fad which will pick it up but if you're talking about merchandise, these categories are often growing or they're very stable and they're very dependable. And that's something that books don't always have, you know, once the excitement over a new release starts to fade. The um, sales of non-book merchandise basically can help supplement your book publishing income uh, if you do it in a smart way. So the other thing to keep in mind is that we as book publishers we have an advantage that a lot of other creators of merchandise don't have and that we have IP. IP means intellectual property. So we have things like designs, we have characters, we have maybe some graphics that we've used in our books, um, all kinds of things that we can apply directly to certain types of products. And I'm going to show you some examples in a little bit. We also have access to low-cost platforms. And in this video series, I've talked about some of them, but they include things like Amazon Seller, uh, Amazon advertising, and this allows us to bring our merchandise uh, to a different audience and also to, to go outside of Amazon too. Uh, eBay, that's a, that's a platform that I use to sell some of my products, and I also have several websites where I sell my products as well, directly to consumers. And, you know, one thing about indie book publishers in particular is that we're the types of people who, who move fast and we, we try new ideas, and maybe we can take risks that larger companies can't take where larger companies just don't have the time to deal with. And what I've done with some of the products that I'll show you in a little bit is that this, this is something that was relatively easy for me to develop and to release and test out, uh, specifically using Amazon Seller. And I'll be talking about how that might work for you as well. So here's a history of one of the ancillary products that I developed. Um, and it, it actually came about because I noticed on the books, I published the In 30 Minutes series of guidebooks. And I noticed when I looked on the product detail pages for those guidebooks underneath frequently bought together and customers who bought this item also bought, I saw these products that were not published by me. They were published by another company, uh, but people were buying my book and then they were turning around and buying these other products at the same time. And these products, they were cheat sheets, basically simple explanations of how to use Excel or Microsoft Word or something like that. And uh, I realized that, well, if they can do that, certainly I can do it too. I, after all, I already have the IP, the, the books, Excel Basics in 30 Minutes and Microsoft Word in 30 Minutes. It explains how to do the things that might appear in a cheat sheet, although it's in a condensed format and it's not, it doesn't have all the examples uh, that I used in the books themselves. So what I did is I created a series of cheat sheets for my, for my own company. And this is based on content that came directly from the books. 
I, re I released it uh, using the Amazon Advantage program because they have ISBNs on them. And now this is, you know, a, you know, it's a minor part of my my business, and they're very popular. And of what I what I hoped would happen has happened. That is, when people are buying Excel Basics in thirty minutes or Google Drive and Docs in thirty minutes, they're also buying some of the cheat sheets that I've produced. And that's not the only thing that I've done. Uh, in 2015, I released a book, Genealogy Basics in 30 Minutes, by author Shannon Combs Bennett. And this book actually suggested the idea of using paper genealogy forms to help track your research. And I, I knew about the forms before, but I didn't anticipate that this was actually something that was, was particularly popular. Uh, but the author mentioned that, yes, they are. And while she suggested looking online and downloading them from some uh, free web server, I thought, well, what if I printed them on high, high quality paper and improved the designs a little bit? Could that be something that people liked? And so I launched a product the following year, the uh, Blank Genealogy Form Starter Kit. And this has, this, this, it started to take off. And actually, uh, I think in the coming years, these will sell more, far more than the, um, than the Genealogy Basics book. So that's, that's how I created a brand based on an idea that came out of a book. And these, the, the, this particular product line, it's not a book. I use a printer, and actually I use many of the same skills and the, the, and the professionals that I use in, in my publishing business to help me develop these products. But they're not books. They have UPC codes. And if you search on Amazon, as well as on my website, you can find them. So when it comes time to actually deciding, well, what sort of product should you create, you have to take several things into consideration. If obvious thing is like try to determine what people want. Um, that could be your existing readers. You have to evaluate whether there's sufficient demand. So let's say that you have a popular a romance novel series, and maybe the the cover is the cover of the book is very distinct, or people like it a lot. And you've sold ten thousand copies of these books. Well, do you think you could convert maybe one or two or three percent of those readers to people who are actually buying like a coffee cup with that design on it? And uh, you can evaluate demand in a couple different ways, and I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but also, it's, it's nice to think about, well, maybe there's an opportunity to develop new customers for your product. So uh, maybe, to give you an example, the genealogy sheets that I create for my own company, that's not a, that's those, the people buying those, they're not all readers of Genealogy Basics in 30 minutes. And, and in fact, many of the people who are buying them they don't need genealogy basics in 30 minutes because they're already experienced genealogists, but this is a product that appeals to them too. So I kind of expanded my customer base by developing these new products. In terms of how to find out, well, you can, easy ways just to do is just to check out, see what the competition is doing. Uh, but you can also take a look at the also bots and frequently bought together on Amazon. That's exactly what I did for the cheat sheets. Check out the reviews of those particular products and maybe there's some opportunity that the that the other companies are missing or there's something that people really like that you can duplicate. And then also take a look at the reviews of your own products. Maybe people are actually asking for a special product or a special way to look at the information in the, in the books that, you're, in the books that you're, you're producing. Or maybe they'll say something like, yeah, I just thought the cover art for the book was fantastic. Um, you know, it'd be great to see it in a larger format. Well, how about make a poster out of that? So, and then, and then also, if you have your own mailing list, and of course, for many publishers, this is like a requirement nowadays, you need to have a mailing list of at least a couple hundred people to kind of announce new releases and whatnot. You can survey, the, survey those people, send out a survey and say, hey, we're thinking of developing some new products. Would this be something that you're interested in? You can also talk one-on-one -on -one with readers, maybe at a book signing or some other event. And then this is another uh, strategy you can use or a tactic you can use. Create a pre-order page on the website that explains, hey, we're going to be launching a new series of copy, coffee cups featuring the characters from our romance series. Uh, sign up now to, to be the first one to get to order them or you know, to get access to a 20% discount, something like that. And based on the, the demand or the, based on the number of people signing up for that, you can determine, well, this is actually a product that might work out. So there's another, set, there's another side to creating products. It's not just a matter of what people want, but what you can actually make. Um, and what you can develop. You have to differentiate stuff. So, of course, you know, you, just copying, copying the cheat sheets like, like the, uh, the example that I gave before, it's not just I was just copying the exact design. I was actually doing, I, I did my own design, and also I highlighted certain information that I thought that readers would like to see, 
and I presented the information in a different way. So it's not just you know doing a straight straight copy of what somebody else is doing. You have to make it diff different than other products out there. Um, there's all kinds of products you can do. So branded merchandise. That's the you know the Game of Thrones example. Complementary products. That's like the the genealogy sheets that I mentioned, and then paid digital products. So this might be something where you go to the website and you can download a copy of the author, you know, reading reading a chapter of the book or uh, some sort of some some other sort of digital product that they're interested in. Have to take into account the skills your team has. That's not only you uh, and the people on the staff of your company, but also the partners that you turn to. So my company, I have a I have a group of very experienced designers and editorial folks that I frequently turn to to help out with uh, book projects, and sometimes they I call them in to help out with these ancillary products as well. Um, you know, maybe your authors have some special skills or insights that they can that they can bring to the table. I mentioned genealogy basics in thirty minutes. Um, you know, Shannon mentioned Shannon in her book mentioned that yes, this is this is something that 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 people do. They use these forms, so that kind of validated the idea. I also turned to her to ask her, well, you know, if I created something like this and I I use the the the, uh, tr the the trademark or the the brand name Easy Genie would people get that would it be offensive and she was able to help me evaluate that and then also you have to think about you know who do you need to go to outsource manufacturing or design these maybe you don't have those skills kind of in your circle already so you have to start to ask around or find a way you can find people who can make that uh, maybe you have to purchase some special assets that go into the product that could be something as simple as a stock stock photograph or it could be you know the the paper used to manufacture something or that like for instance the packaging you have to buy a box that the product goes into uh, but it could also be licensing if you're actually going to be licensing some some somebody else's work you have to think about how long it will take you know when you manufacture something depending on how complicated it is or where the manufacturing is taking place it can take many months to get your hands on it and then some additional time to get it to Amazon's warehouse or get it ready for shipping out to customers if you're selling on your website. And let's take a let's take a look at an example of a book. Um, I use this example in some of the live presentations I give. It's a product brainstorming exercise. And this is a book. It's provided courtesy of Stonebridge Press. And the book is titled Family Crests of Japan. Um, and those designs you see there each one of those corresponds to a certain family in, you know, in ancient times. And I think there's many hundreds of them uh, representing different, different surnames. And it's kind of like a, a parallel is in Scotland. They have the clans for the different um, clans of Scotland. Th this is a similar idea, but it's, in, but it's in Japan. And if you were looking at this and thinking, well, gee, you know, well, it's, it's a little bit esoteric almost. It's kind of academic. But actually, there's lots of possibilities with this because this is a design-focused uh, book cover, and also there's information in there about the about the designs and where they come from. So you can start to utilize good designs right away. And when I've talked with people and asked for, well, let's see what we can make, all kinds of great ideas came came out there. So people were suggesting things like T-shirts or pajamas, uh, buttons. These would be like buttons you can put on a shirt and maybe make them very stand out in some way. Embroidery patterns, uh, flags, and posters. And then somebody even suggested you could create a search engine. So if you entered the surname, the Japanese surname, it would show the design, the corresponding design. And then maybe you could have products that were offered based on, based on the results in the search engine. So there's lots of different possibilities of what you can do with that type of book. So let's take a look at another type of book. This is a, kids, a series of a kids books, courtesy of Red Chair Press. And you can see that they're really focused on the... Uh, you know, seasonal activities. So what sorts of products could you do that were maybe based on seasonal activities? Well, the obvious thing is you could have some sort of coloring book that goes along with the, you know, the, the editorial content of these particular books. Maybe you could even have some sort of, I don't know, like uh, different types of clothing for different types of activities. So for the sweet summer or what we do in summer, you could have like a towel with that pattern on it. Or maybe you could have like a a set of uh, tools you can use to bring to the beach. Um, there, there's all kinds of ways that you could you could think about that. And then you know another thing for in particular for educational products is you can create like lesson plans or something else that teachers can use. Maybe it's a digital download, uh, low cost or um, maybe even free. Uh, but th these are the types of things that might appeal to to uh, to your customers. And so and also one last example about 
you know, brainstorming. One time at the uh, Independent Book Publishers Association, uh, Ben Franklin's award ceremony, this is held every year. It honors the best uh, excellence in publishing, in independent publishing. And the book that won was a book by a roofer about roofing, like, you know, the types of shingles to use and considerations for replacing your roof and whatnot. And I was thinking that would be a great book for developing ancillary products, like working with manufacturers of different types of shingles or, um, you know, maybe a special type of, of glue that they use or, I don't know, roofing nails or whatever. Because all of a sudden, this relatively boring class of products, now they have a champion who's like an award-winning champion and an expert. And like that, that, that brand for that book, that can become something that's used for these other types of products that are related to, related to roofing. Oops, wrong way. Okay, so, you know, when you're thinking of different products to evaluate, you know, some of the suggestions that you come up with may be easy to develop and relatively cheap. Others may be more expensive. And I've kind of created a, a grid here showing where things fall generally. And of course, there may be some variation depending on how, how far you want to go with it. The blue ones are digital products, like a, P, a PDF or, you know, maybe an audio file or some sort of, you know, video training or even an app. Whereas the, the red things are actual physical products that are manufactured in some respect. And I think that the place, the place where most publishers should be concentrating is here. It's cheap and easy. And when I say easy, it usually means it's, the manufacturing is not that hard and it won't take a long time. Um, the advantage of doing this, of course, is that you can actually, you, you're, you're not taking as big a risk and you're getting something out there relatively quickly. When you're starting to get up into the, uh, the hard area or the expensive area, that takes a lot of time to figure that out. Like if you're developing an app or some sort of custom manufactured good that has never been made before and you're working with you know engineers and designers and stuff to make that, that that's going to take a lot of time and cost a lot of money. And you have to really think, well, all right, it's, it's going to do this and it's a great idea, but is it something that's going to result in a, in a, in a good return for the business? You have to, you have to consider these things yourself. I generally play in this particular arena. And then, you know, one, one other thing to keep in mind, for books themselves, books are usually cheap, but they're actually quite hard to produce, you know? So you, th that would be over here. So we want to be doing stuff that's, that's less difficult to make than to design and make than a, uh, that, than a book. So I've given you many examples already, but this is kind of where I think we should, we should be playing. And then, you know, it's not... I haven't even scratched the surface of the stuff you need to do to make a product come to market. There's a lot of steps involved, design, prototyping. That means kind of creating a test version. You can show it to your test audiences, or maybe you could just make sure that it, you know, it doesn't break or it's, it's workable. If you're manufacturing, maybe you have to deal with more than one supplier. And that adds to the difficulty in terms of coordinating everybody to make sure that a certain part is at a certain facility at a certain time. Shipping, that's a cost that you have to take care of in some way, or your manufacturer will bill it to you. And it's not just between manufacturers or to your office or to your warehouse, it's to Amazon's warehouse as well. Packaging is a huge one. I'll get into that in a minute. And then Amazon has its own requirements. So they're very careful about what sorts of products are allowed to be sold in their marketplace. There are restricted categories, which you can't, you can't easily release something. Um, they also are concerned about safety and whether or not something is age appropriate. So they'll ask you questions like this. And if your product has batteries or there's some other potential dangerous aspect of it, toxic materials or something that goes against uh, local, local laws, that's going to cause issues for you. So you have to start to plan for that too. Every product in Amazon, or I should say most products in Amazon, they require a barcode. So if it's a book, that means an ISBN. If it's a, another type of product, it means a UPC code, which is also known as a GTIN, G-T-I-N. Shipping requirements. So you have to you know, not only make sure that you get it to Amazon's warehouse, but also it has to be packaged in a certain way and there has to be a barcode on it or you have to pay Amazon to put the barcode on it for you. And the packaging. So this is a step that's easy to overlook and I've seen some some uh, manufacturers and some brands really mess this up. They just don't spend a lot of time on the packaging, literally like slipping it into a loose, a loose fitting plastic bag. <laughs> you know, that's, and that's bare, it looks, 
not only does it look terrible for the customers who receive it, it may not actually protect it that much when it's when it's in uh, transit from one place to another. Um, there's all kinds of options. You can use cardboard. You can use a box. Some of the boxes are just like off the shelf. You can buy them someplace, or you know, buy them in bulk and then use them to package your item, and then you know, put a sticker on top of it. Special materials that would be like a plastic or styrofoam to protect something from breaking. A shrink wrapped item. So I use shrink wrapping for some of my products, and it works pretty well. And um, you know, there's there's many other options, and this is something you'll need to discuss with your manufacturer. Size and weight is a huge thing. It has a direct impact on your cost. And I'm going to show you an example. And it's easy to make mistakes. And I say that because I've made mistakes. And this chart may not be so obvious what it's talking about. But you'll see in the left column, it says 50 sheets and 40 sheets. So I created a, a bundle of genealogy sheets. And the initial version I created had 50 sheets. Uh, the, the price was $19.99. The weight was 13.3 ounces. But when you shipped it, it was more than a pound. And this is important because if it's more than a pound, you cannot use U.S. Postal Service first class mail. You have to use priority mail. And that increases your prices right away. So generally, I had to use a flat rate mailer, which costs $6.99. Uh, FBM fee, this is the fee I had to pay if I was shipping it myself. Um, if it was FBA fees, it would be even more than that. Uh, but the what happened at the end was I, I actually redesigned the product so it didn't have as many sheets in it, but I gave more sheets of the type that people liked and uh, kept the price the same. And what happened was the net, that is the money that my company received, whether using Amazon FBA or Amazon FBM, FBM is I, deli I ship it to customers, FBA is Amazon ships it to customers using uh, Amazon Prime. The amount of money I got from each product went up by more than two dollars each each unit, I should say. So that was a, that that makes a difference if you're selling thousands of of units. So that's a example of where I made a mistake. I made some assumptions when I was making something and designing something at the beginning. I didn't take into account the the size and the weight, and because that directly affects your shipping costs, it also affects the fees you have to pay to Amazon. For more information on how to get the most out of Amazon programs. I've created this video series. It's available on leanmedia.org. Click on the video link. You can also connect with me on social media. Uh, thank you so much for watching this episode and stay tuned for more.